That's some wonderful words. It's a shame we can't blast them out as we normally would. But um, it's good to be able to listen to the, to the words of those hymns. We're going to read from God's word. We're reading from, again from Exodus, Exodus and chapter 24. Exodus chapter 24. Now he, that's God, said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Naboth and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses shall come up near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning, built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent the young men of the children of Israel, who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you, according to all these words. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Naboth, and Abiel, and seventy of elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. They saw God, they ate and they drank. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain, but be there and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments, which I have written, that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up the mountain of God. He said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back and come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. And so Moses went into the midst of the cloud. He went up to, into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Amen. So Jeremy's going to come and speak to the children, I think, for a few minutes. Well, Fernando, now they've got another picture for you this week. Anybody recognise anyone in that picture? Well, if you're not sure, we're looking at this one and this one. One of them is handsome, intelligent and charming, and the other one is wearing an English rugby shirt. <laughs> now they're both watching a game. One of them is winning, and one of them is losing. I wonder if you can tell which one is winning and which one is losing. He certainly looks the happier. He's not looking very happy at all. They're watching a game of rugby between England and Wales. And when England and Wales play rugby, it's like two enemies getting together. I'm sure when Grandad played rugby, he was a true gentleman on the rugby field. But nowadays, you watch them on the rugby field, they don't tend to like each other when they're playing. And it looks like they're enemies, England against Wales, big enemies. And then when it's all over, they're all like their big friends. And they're all like their big mates. But you look at it, and you might think these people are enemies. Nobody likes enemies. Nobody likes to have enemies. But Jesus says, the people who follow me, the people who go to church, the people who love me, are going to have enemies. They're going to have people that don't like the fact 
that you might read his Bible or sing songs or go to church. And they might want to make life difficult for us, whether that's in school, at home, or wherever it has, has to be. And Jesus says a remarkable thing. He says, love your enemies. Now, that's a hard thing. That's not an easy thing to do. If people are doing things which are unkind or unpleasant because you go to church. But Jesus says, love your enemies. And what's really amazing is this. Before somebody becomes a Christian, the Bible says you're an enemy of God. We're God's enemies. And how does God treat his enemies? Well, the Bible says God loves them. Thank you, Jeremy. So we're going to be looking at this section that we read together from Exodus in chapter 24 this morning, this afternoon even, Exodus chapter 24. Two things, two headings really this afternoon. Now a good preacher normally got three, which will probably tell you something about myself. I got two this afternoon. And uh, the two are these. The first one is, it's about a promise, a promise that has been sealed with blood. The second one is, Moses enters into the presence of God. Now, the, the great truth of the Christian message, the great truth of the Bible is, we can actually know personal fellowship with God. We can know a way to God because of what he's done for us through his son. There's access now into the very presence of God. You don't need to come to any person. You don't have to go through any ceremony. We don't have to go to any group of people. We can actually have personal fellowship with God. We can have communion with him. And by faith in his son, what he has done and how he achieved that, as we'll see shortly, there is a way into the presence of God. And what we're doing when we read the book of Exodus, we're reading what God is unfolding and he's showing people of the truths that are contained in the Bible of how we approach God and how we can ever come to know fellowship with God. So Exodus chapter 24, if you wanted a title, it would be Drawing near to God. Drawing near to God. Now that's something which we should all consider. Drawing near to God. We've been watching, or we talked about you, we've been reading over these last weeks and months how Israel has become established as a nation. They would become a people who would be different to any other nation in the world because they were God's chosen nation. And we see that God had given them directions he's given them laws which have been written down we, we've seen in the last chapters from chapter 20 to 23 that Moses expanded on these truths and these laws to teach the people and they said that to enter into the very presence of God one would have to be holy because God is set apart from mankind God is is holy and the only way by which people can come to know God is by what we call the grace of God in that God sets his favour, which is not deserved, upon people like he did upon the children of Israel. And what he looks for the, from them is this. He looks from them, from us, for us to be faithful to what he has told us and what he's revealed to us. And that we put him above everything and anything else in our lives. So Exodus chapter 24 looks back on certain things. It's looking forward to certain things. The people had come to Mount Sinai, chapter 19 and verse 17 tells us they'd arrived at this mountain and they were going to be there for some time and they've been waiting to hear God's commands the ten commandments the unfolding of the law and they've been having instructions from Moses over these last weeks they've been told in chapter 19 and verse 21 they shouldn't even come near the mountain they shouldn't touch this mountain because God is going to presence himself on that mountain They've seen something of the splendor of God and the majesty of God in that they've seen lightning and they've heard thunder, they've been, they've been smoke. They've even heard the sound of a trumpet and here is at this mountain is where God is going to meet with his people. So Moses, he's about to reclimb or go up the mountain yet again. Now he's not a young fella. Moses is getting on in years. To be involved in any mountain climbing, you've got to be normally quite young and you've got to be quite fit. My, my son-in-law, Miles, as some of you know, well, he's done quite a bit of mountain climbing in his time. 
he's like the rest of us. He's getting on a bit, of, getting on a little bit now. He's over the mark of fifty, but I still think he likes to do a bit of climbing and rock climbing. Joel has started rock climbing. He does a bit of rock climbing rather than than mountaineering. But to to be a, a mountaineer, you've got to be fit and you've got to be. Well, Moses is not a young man. Exodus is telling us about this man now. Who's, this old man's going to go up this mountain. Back in 1953, Sir Edmund Hillary, you'll know, climbed Everest. Now, Sir Edmund Hillary had a relation in the village here. So, Mrs. Hillary used to come to the ladies' meeting, and it was not far from where, where Lynn, well, your daughter's moving into the house now, of course. Sarah's living in the, Mrs. Hillary's house. Well, Mr. Hillary was either the first or the second cousin to Sir Edmund Hillary. And, um, but Sir Edmund Hillary said something like this. He said, Going up a mountain is one thing, also getting down is very important. That's a fair comment. It's good to climb a mountain, but you want to come down as you, as you end up, not quickly. So to climb a mountain is one thing, but Sir Edmund Hillary said, it's all right getting up the mountain, it's coming down is important as well. So Moses, he's going to go up that mountain, he's going to ascend the mountain. That's what chapter 24 is about. It's about the ascent of Moses up the mountain. This old man is beginning to climb the mountain but he's actually going to enter into the presence of a holy god how could a sinful man and moses wasn't perfect how could a sinful man come into the presence of almighty god how could a, a holy man go up the, a sinful man go up a mountain come into the very presence of god and still come back down the mountain again well that's what we're going to see verses one and two of this chapter God has said to Moses, come up to me, come up to the mountain, bring with you Aaron, Nabab, Abihu, and send to the elders. Before they came up, I want to have an agreement with them. In other words, a covenant. They're going to make a promise with me. To ratify this promise, this covenant, there will have to be blood that is shed. Now, when my children were growing up, especially the boys... I used to sit there. I was, I'm an authority on Indians. When I was growing up as a child, I could tell you, I don't know how many tribes I, would I could tell you. If you ask me now, I know dozens of Indian tribes. I used to just be into Indians. I don't know why. But when, we, when, I, when the boys were growing up, it was about the girls sometimes, but I would tell them a story, make up a little story about, about, about the Lone Ranger or something. And they'd sit down and then I'd come to a part where there was an Indian in it and I'd put on an Indian voice. Joel only told me recently he thought I could speak Indian language when he when I was when he, when he was young because to talk in this garbage but it sounded like, I'm going to do it now but it sounded like a and and, and the India I was a bit of an authority on Indians anyway but if you if you watch the westerns in those early days sometimes a, a, a white man would become or befriend an Indian they'd become very close and they would decide to become brothers and the way they would actually come to the conclusion and show that they were brothers they would cut each other's arm and then they'd hold the blood against each other and they would become blood brothers so the shedding of the blood was and the, the joining together was to ratify this this decision that they'd made that now the, the white man and the indian were going to become brothers so blood had to be shed to to make this possible now there was a ceremony in verses three to eight which was going to involve blood at the bottom of this, this mountain. Moses, in verses 3 and verses 7 of this chapter, Moses has been reading to them the, the, the laws that God would have brought to them, the, the word of God. The people, they dissented to what Moses had to say. The Lord had spoken, and what they said was this, what the Lord has spoken, we will do. We'll obey what God has said. The reason was, they believed that what Moses was saying came directly from God. Now, we've had the Bible read this afternoon already. As Christians believe this. This Bible, especially as it was originally given, this Bible is God's word to mankind. It's infallible. It's inspired of God. It has not got mistakes. Now, we're not talking about, we're talking about the Bible as God gave it. It's God-given. It's God's word. These people listened to what Moses said, and they believed what Moses was saying was the very word of God. 2 Timothy in chapter 3, in verses 16 and 17, the apostle Paul's writing to this young minister, and he says this, Remind the people this. 
all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped in every good work. So we believe this is God's word. In one sense, we've got a service here this afternoon, and I'm probably, Jeremy's contributed, but generally I'm saying that most has got to be said this afternoon. But the, the, the actual most important part of the service is when the Bible's read. Because I'm going to explain to you certain things about what the Bible says. But when this is read, this is actually the word of God to mankind. This is not without question. We're not to dip, This is God's word. So it's a very important part of the service when the Bible is, is read. Verses 4 to 8. Moses gets an altar built at the bottom of the, the mountain. Gets 12 big stones. One stone for each of the 12 tribes. Begins to build the altar. Then he sends in verse 5, he sends the young men out to get some bullocks. The bullocks are put to death. They shed their blood. The blood is caught in a basin. And then the blood then is, half of the blood is sprinkled over the altar. The altar of worship. The people make their promises in verse 8. They say, we're going to be your people. We're going to obey what you've got to say. We're going to stay with you. And the blood has been sprinkled over the, the altar. But then the blood is sprinkled over the people. I don't quite know how it happened, but they sprinkled the, Moses sprinkled the blood over the people. It was a bit like the Indian and the white man saying, this is to ratify, this is to say now, we are in agreement with what we're saying. So as we read the Bible, what becomes apparent is, the blood is continually spoken about. You can't get away from it. All the way through the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, it keeps talking about blood. The life is in the blood. It's continually speaking about blood. Even our hymns, which we sing and we don't always think what we're singing. This, the great hymn, Man of Sorrows, what a name. It says this, sealed our pardon with his blood, is one of the lines in the hymn. Sealed our pardon with his blood. So blood is a central theme to the Bible. From the beginning of time, when Adam and Eve fell, the first blood was shed because an animal had to die, didn't it? For the skin to be provided to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve because of their, their wickedness. And throughout the Old Testament, atonement was made through the blood sacrifice. It was offered on behalf of the people so that their sins could be forgiven. The animal became the substitute and would die in the place of the person who, was, who it was representing. The blood was shed. The reason was this. So that God could actually pour out just judgment upon sin. Justice could be met. The blood was shed to meet with the judgment and to allow for cleansing of the sins that had been committed. You see, God just could not be approached because there's a barrier. This sin barrier was a major problem. And we believe that God had opened up this way. Sin was to separate man from God. But blood would be shed. Colossians in chapter, chapter 1 and verses 28, we read these words. Sorry, Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 to 22. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell us in Jesus. And by him reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, and make peace through the blood of the cross. See, the blood of the cross. The Bible is clear. You see, God is actually angry with sin. It sounds strange just to say God could be angry. God is angry with sin. And it's not an anger like we've got. I mean, Jeremy talking about me playing rugby. Well, I can't say that I never, ever got angry on the field. It's to my shame, but I can't say I never, ever got angry. God's anger isn't like my anger. If somebody poked me in the eye or whatever, there would be an anger which would build up, wouldn't it? Well, God's anger isn't temper. It isn't aggression. It isn't God's anger. It's an anger which is a righteous indignation is the way it's, we speak about it. It's an anger which is deserved. So to remove God's 
anger against sin, wrath against sin, payment had to be made. Judgment had to be met. And the scripture makes clear the blood of the sacrifice would be that atonement means. So he sprinkled the altar. He sprinkled the, the people to remove the guilt so that they could be able to know cleansing. He's the forgiver. He's the one who forgives people even when they break his laws. They can be acquitted, but justice and judgment has to be met. Why did Jesus come? John chapter 1 verse 29. John the Baptist says, here he comes. This is the Lamb of God. And what's the Lamb of God going to do when the Jews knew a lamb was used for sacrifice? What's the Lamb of God going to do? The Lamb of God is going to take away the sin of the world. So the old covenant pointed to this one who would come to be that final sacrifice. Luke chapter 22 and verse 20, the Lord's Supper, when it was introduced by Jesus. He says this, this cup, this wine, is to signify his blood, the cup of the new covenant in my blood. So when he instituted the communion service, he's saying, this is to signify that blood will be the means whereby our sins can be atoned for. He's to be the one who remove that anger and wrath that God should have upon us. Now in the Bible, we've got 1 John chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2. Beloved, have I got the right reference? One, sorry. 1 John chapter 2, yes, verses 1 and 2. My children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Listen to this. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. Not for ours, but for the whole world. Now, I don't know if anybody here ever reads the word propitiation. It's not a word that we use very often. The word there means this. That he died so that the wrath of God, the anger against sin, could be averted, could be removed. Jesus Christ became the propitiation. You don't need to remember that, that word, but it is an important word. It means that God's wrath and anger is averted from us by faith in what Jesus Christ has done. So, by the blood of Jesus Christ, this forgiveness of sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. God was in Christ. What was he doing? It says he was reconciling the world to himself. He is the only way to God. So Moses took the, took the, the blood. It was the blood then of the old covenant. It reminds us of what was going to come in the days to come. In Hebrews in chapter 9 and verses 19 and 20 there. Hebrews 9 and verse 19 and 20. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, according to the law, what did he do? He took blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and he sprinkled both itself and the people saying this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 24 Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than of Abel the blood in the old testament which Moses is sprinkled it was all pointed to this one whose blood would be shed so we look to Jesus, you see, as the only hope for us to be forgiven for our sins. As the only means of refuge, the only means of hope in the presence of an almighty God. And as the people saw the sacrifice and the blood applied, literally, well, that was what Jesus did spiritually for us. The people of, of Israel were delivered from Egypt and God was going to dwell with them, but in a special way. The Christian has been delivered by faith from sin. And God promises to dwell with him, as we'll see. Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 10 to 12 there. By that will have him been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. Now every priest stands ministering daily, offering repeated the same sacrifice, which can never take away his sins. But this man, 
You see, that was the old covenant. This man in the new covenant. He has offered himself one sacrifice for sin forever. When he done it, he sat down at the right hand of God. The blood was shed. The sacrifice was made once and for all. Never to be repeated. Once Jesus came and offered himself as a sacrifice for sin. Hebrews 10 and verse 19 and 20. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest... How are you going to get into the holy presence of God? To enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By a new and a living way which he consecrated to us through the veil in his flesh. There's a lot of verses there. Which you can read them when they're up on the board then. And, but a lot of verses speaking about blood. And so their promise, their covenant was, was ratified by the shedding of the blood of an animal. A covenant was made to keep the promises that God had made to them. To trust in the word of God. And then we have this group of people, or Moses eventually going into the very presence of God himself. Verses 10 and 11, this group, they start to go up the mountain with Moses a certain way. They have a glimpse of the glory of God. Just a little glimpse of heaven. We, we're told in scripture, we don't really understand all that's in heaven. We've got little glimpses. We see through a dark glass. We don't really understand everything. But one day we're going to be able to see and be exposed to that great place. They're going to see a little glimpse, go up the mountain, they have a glimpse of, of the glory of God. Verses 12 to 14, they are summoned into the presence of God. But in verses 15 to 18, only Moses will enter into the very presence. So Moses goes up the mountain. He's going to mediate on behalf of the people to God. When he gets to the top, God is going to write those commandments on stone for him. And all that God had revealed in Scripture, Paul says this, even these things that were happening Thousands of years before, which was about sacrifices and, and animals and altars. All these things, we don't say that's the Old Testament. All these things were written for our instruction, says Paul, in righteousness. He leaves the elders part of the way up. He says to them, I'm leaving Aaron and her. If you've got a problem, go to these two. They'll look after you, your problems. Joshua goes up a little bit further with Moses. This old man helps him probably up the mountain. The people at the foot of the mountain, the great congregation is looking up at the mountain. And they see this old man, he's still climbing up, up the mountain. Until he goes out of sight as the cloud engulfs him at the top of the mountain. Verses 16 and 17. The glory of God dwelt on that mountain. There was cloud, there was fire. This was the place where Moses was to meet with God. Moses stays there. For 40 days and, and 40 nights. Moses enters into the very presence of God. He was going to become the mediator, the go-between. The elders, they could go so far. Joshua came for, so far. But Moses enters into the very presence of God. The cloud where God's presence was. The, the symbol of God's presence in verse 16. The presence of the glory of the Lord rested on Sinai. It's the same word that's used with regard to the, the presence of God when he was in the inner sanctuary, in the temple and in the tabernacle. God was going to be there, resting as it were in that, in that particular place. God dwelt, God tabernacled with the people. But only Moses could draw near. The blessings of God of being able to draw near to God. Verses 14 to 18. You see the people could look up. They could see the cloud. They could see the fire. And they could say, couldn't they? As this is our God who is a consuming fire. In John 1 in the, in the New Testament. John speaks of seeing the glory of God. Because they saw Jesus Christ. As God dwelt at Sinai. So John reminds us. God became flesh and he rested or he dwelt amongst us. John chapter 1 and verse 14, John says this. As apostles, as those who were with Jesus, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. 
Six days, Moses on the mountain and the cloud of the glory. On the seventh day, God begins to speak to Moses. Verse 17, the people see the fire. Verse 18, Moses had an experience that no one else will ever have. He had a communion with God directly. He's the mediator. He's going to be the representative of God's people. He was having fellowship directly with God. Moses was the mediator. Moses was the mediator of the old covenant. Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 5 and 6. Who served the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things in accordance to the pattern shown on the mountain. But now he obtained a more excellent ministry. Insomuch as he is a mediator of a better covenant. Which is established on better promises. Moses was the mediator. Jesus is the mediator. His blood is shed. It's not the blood of bullocks any longer or, or lambs. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. He opens up the way whereby people can commune with God. In Jesus Christ we have communion and access to God directly. Moses in the Old Testament. The Old Testament saints. They had fellowship with God but continually sacrifices were being made. The Christian through the death of Jesus Christ we have fellowship with God. Fellowship with God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. The scripture says this, you know, who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? But it's only those who've got clean hands and a pure heart. We told you to do your hands on the way in, do your hands on the way out. But that won't get us into the presence of God. He's talking there figuratively and saying we need to be cleansed to be able to come up to the mountain and enter into the presence of God. The cleansing of the heart. In other words, by faith in Jesus Christ, we can know that cleansing. Because he's offered his blood once and for all for sin. We can come into the presence of God. We can know daily communion with him. And the Bible says this, to know him is to know life eternal. Moses is in the presence of God, but it foreshadows the fact that one day there will be people like ourselves who could have direct communion with God through faith in Jesus Christ. The last 10 months, if it hasn't done anything else, it's helped us to understand the, the, the value of gathering together as churches, as people together. We, we've missed being together as we, we normally could be. The Bible tells us when the church gathers, he's in the midst and he's there to bless us. To have fellowship with one another is, is tremendous and to be in the presence of God is to, to be a great privilege with the people of God. But we've got a little bit of a taste of what it's like to be on our own as well. To have a little bit of a taste of what it must have been like for the persecuted church today and in yesteryear. When people cannot meet or could not meet with those of like mind. Even today, we've got Zoom, we've got whatever, we can watch. Can you imagine people who are isolated and unable to have fellowship with others? But even then, they are and they have been able to have fellowship with God. We're able to come into the presence of God, not dependent upon a church, not dependent upon a priest or anybody else. As important, and I believe it's vitally important, the church gathers together. And I think that's what God commands. But there's a way open that we can come to him at any time. If we come in through Jesus Christ. For all who believe in him. He says to them, come unto me all you are heavy laden and weary. And I will give you rest. The sacrifice has been made. The blood has been shed. Once and for all to cleanse us from sin. None of us here this afternoon. I don't know you all that well, do I? But I'm pretty confident of this. None of us here deserve to be in the presence of a holy God. The best amongst us. None of us deserve that. In actual fact, we all just deserve to be judged for our sin, don't we? But in Jesus Christ, he became our propitiation, that big word again. He became the one that will avert that wrath, that anger that should have come against my sin because he's taken it upon himself. To know him who should be our judge, can be our friend and our saviour. We can know communion and fellowship with him. 
at all situations and in every part of the day. Drawing near to God. Moses had a wonderful privilege. We have a greater privilege, I believe. A promise, when it was sealed with blood, they said it would be our promise to be right with God has been sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Moses enters into the presence of God. We can enter the presence of God because Jesus has gone before us and opened up that way. Pray that we know that in our own hearts, that communion with God ourselves. We're going to close by having this final hymn, which reminds us again, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's stand and sing. That doesn't mean you're going to stand. Let's pray. And Father, we're amazed of your love towards mankind, towards sinners like ourselves. We know that was displayed by sending your only begotten Son into this world, and that he was willing to be able to shed his blood so that our sins could be removed, that the wrath that should be against us was placed upon him. We pray that we each know that in our own hearts, that we put our trust in him and him alone, and that we'll know what it is to be able to enter into your presence daily any time of day, in any place. So we ask now that you'll go with us, you'll remain with us, you'll keep us, and you'll bless us, for we'd ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.